To quote the great Jimi Hendrix, knowledge speaks, but wisdom listens. You're listening to The Wisdom Project, a podcast that does just that. We listen. My name is Doug Boyd, director of the Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History in the University of Kentucky Libraries. The Wisdom Project is a podcast that uses oral history, the recording and preservation of interviews, with the purpose of documenting individual life stories. The Nunn Center has been recording and archiving oral histories since 1973. Speaking of the archive, I want to introduce you to Copana Terry. She's the one who will be co-hosting and co-producing this podcast with me. I'm Copana. I'm the oral history archivist at the Nunn Center. The Wisdom Project will feature engaging stories from the oral history archive. We get to listen to these stories, and this podcast gives you a chance to listen as well. Now, I may be biased, but I believe the recording and preservation of oral history can make this world a better place. We need more listening. Don't worry, we won't do a long introduction every time. Unless Doug changes his mind. Now, on to episode number one of The Wisdom Project. In 1952, a 23-year-old Jacqueline Bouvier, a graduate of George Washington University with a degree in French literature, met and fell in love with a young congressman, John F. Kennedy. When they were married the following year, few would realize this young couple would be at the center of a story that people would liken to Arthurian legend. More than likely, you know how the Kennedy story goes, but the reality is there's still a lot of mystery to the Kennedy's years in the White House. Well, the Nunn Center has a rare 1981 interview with Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. The interview was conducted as part of the John Sherman Cooper Oral History Project. John Sherman Cooper was a former county judge, senator from Kentucky at the same time as a young Jack Kennedy. Cooper was also an ambassador, but Cooper and his wife, Lorraine, were close personal friends with the Kennedys. I thought we'd begin by uh, asking... Um, you can recall some of your first impressions of uh, Judge Cooper. Perhaps how you first got to know he and Mrs. Cooper and then what some of your first impressions were. I think I first got to know him maybe 52. Um, I can't remember whether... No, I, I was married in 1953. I remember that he was, we used to go to Charlie Bartlett's for dinner, mm -hmm. and Charlie Bartlett, so I was interested in Jack, and the Coopers were sort of going out together. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'd have many pleasant evenings there, and Senator Gore was often there. Um, so I sort of saw him and Mrs. Cooper there a lot, and that's where you became friends. We were always just about the six of us, maybe eight. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think... My first impression is the same as my pre present impression is. <laughs> you know, his wisdom, his humor, that... Well, I just love, I mean, I, he's such a fine, fine man, and over the years, you, you know, in the Senate, at least with Jack, maybe, who was running around the country so much campaigning, there are not many that, there are not that many senators who get to be your private friends as a couple. Right, that is... Uh... Well, he was one of them. Um, and he remained one. You see, Mrs. Cooper had been a friend of mine before. She used to ask me to dinner parties when I was still either in my last year in college in Washington or the year or so I worked on the newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, I know it was just about the same time, I mean, that we were sort of, you know, courting the same time, <laughs> getting married at the same time. Yeah, you were sharing a lot of the same experience. The interview was conducted by a 30-year-old Terry Birdwhistle. Birdwhistle is one of the founders of the Nunn Center and currently the dean of University of Kentucky Libraries. And it's not because he's my boss that I say. He's a pretty incredible interviewer. He's done nearly a thousand interviews for the Nunn Center over the past four decades. 
Now, it's pretty widely known that Jackie Kennedy was a fairly private person and wasn't doing many interviews at this time. In fact, if the focus of the interview that Bird Whistle was proposing had been on her or her time on the White House, she probably would not have agreed to have done the interview in the first place. But the focus was on her close personal friend, so she agreed. But this episode is not about the story of Jackie Kennedy or the story of John Sherman Cooper. The story is the interview itself. I had a chance to interview the interviewer about his experience interviewing Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis in 1981. I was so intrigued by uh, the relationship that John Sherman Cooper had with the Kennedys. Uh, You know, after Kennedy won the election, the first people uh, they dined with, they went to the Cooper's house for dinner and it it made Life magazine and all this stuff. So, you know, it wasn't just a crazy idea. I mean, I knew that there was a personal relationship there. But there was nobody saying, hey, you ought to interview Jackie Kennedy, because at that time, nobody interviewed Jackie Kennedy. Right. You know, she was working at the publishing house there in New York. Uh, she'd been married to Anassas, and he had, he had died by that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was just uh, a person that you would see uh, in, a, in a photo in some kind of a news magazine or a popular magazine walking down the streets of New York. You know, and everybody would go, oh, that's Jackie Kennedy. Knowing all that, I said, well, what if? You know, I don't know uh, what prompted me, really, but one day I was just sitting there, and I just typed up this letter to Jackie Kennedy. Uh, I guess I knew she was at uh, whatever the publishing house was. I forget. Uh, put it in the mail. Wow. Uh, but I, I sent off the letter, and... Uh, I never thought much about it. And then um, one day, I don't know how long it was after that, who knows. And so this letter comes back and uh, so it's one of those things where, okay, this is the letter that says, thank you for your letter. Mrs. Onassis appreciates being asked, but she's not gonna be able to do this. So he opened it up and it's from her her assistant. And it said that uh, she would like to do the interview and to call her and make the arrangements. So he traveled to New York City. So I'd been to New York some to doing interviews and doing some other stuff. And, you know, I was trying to be really cool about it. And I remember I'd come back from an interview like the day before. And uh, this was back when, um, you know, people couldn't get in touch with you. You know, they did, she didn't have my cell phone number. So I walk in and the desk person at the desk uh, told me I had a message. And he handed me this Algonquin message thing that said uh, Jackie Onassis had called. But it was actually from Nancy Tuckerman, that's her name, because Nancy Tuckerman had called. And so I immediately go, okay, well, here we go. This is, that's all right. He assumed that she was canceling. So he called her back, talked to her assistant, and she wasn't canceling. It was just a minor change in the schedule. After the break, we'll go to Jackie O's house or apartment. This episode of The Wisdom Project is brought to you by the Special Collections Research Center in the University of Kentucky Libraries. I have the Associate Dean for Special Collections, Deirdre Skaggs, here with me to tell us why is the Special Collections Research Center special? Well, we have extensive manuscripts, rare books, and serials, and they are noted for the Kentuckiana and the W. Hugh Peel collections. The latter is a rich collection of early editions and manuscripts of 19th century British and American authors. Seriously, that's pretty special. Now back to the show. So it turns out Jackie O did not cancel the interview. So I asked Harry Birdwhistle if he was starting to get nervous. You know, there's probably maybe a part of me that might have been hoping she was actually canceling it because, you know, it was going to be sort of traumatic. Uh, I tell you what was making me nervous about it was, uh, you know, it was something that I couldn't keep secret, so people knew I was doing it. And so my main anxiety was uh, this was going to be an interview that people would want to listen to and see, hear, hear. Uh, If I screwed it up, you know, it'd be a big screw up. If somehow the recording didn't work, that'd be an even bigger screw up. So the time comes for the interview, and Burbussel is faced with that question that is posed to all visitors to New York, take the subway or take a cab. So I walked out of the hotel and rather than catch a cab to go up to the interview, which would have made the most sense, I go to the subway and get in the subway 
and uh, and I think I know which stop to get out of, but it's really hot in the subway, and so I'm starting to get, you know, kind of disheveled. And because uh, I had hair then, and my hair was kind of getting wet, <laughs> you know, it was really hot. And um, then I come up out of the subway, and it's like I always do in a large city when I come out of the subway, I didn't know, I couldn't figure out where I was and which way to go, and so I kind of walked around, and I was starting to get kind of aggravated myself with myself for saying, well, why'd you do this? You know, what, just trying to be cool or, or what? But anyway, I found my way to the right street, walked up to the door, and there's a, a doorman, of course, and I'm thinking, well, this is, you know, he's gonna tell me, no, I can't go in, and what do I do? Again, I don't have a phone, I can't just call up there and say, I'm downstairs. So I just walk in, he says, he opens the door and I walk in, and somehow, I don't know if he told me or I knew that, or Nancy Tuckerman had told me, take the elevator up to the 12th floor or whatever it was. So there's this little elevator. Get in the elevator and go up. You get off the elevator and there's a door right out, right across the hall from the elevator. Really tight quarters, as I recall. And knock on the door and the door opens and it's Jackie Kennedy on asses, opening the door with her doorman standing right behind her going, oh gosh. <laughs> But she wanted to, that's the way it was. I mean, this was a very personal thing for her. It wasn't like, you know, a journalist coming to interview her. This was somebody coming to talk to her about her friend, John Sherman Cooper. And so it was, from the moment she opened that door, it was personal. Mm. And so she says, uh, you know, we, I introduced myself. She says, well, you know, come in, come in. Probably asked me how long I'd been in New York, what I was doing or something like that, I don't know. But she led me into, uh, we went through sort of a, a living room area into this room off of it, which was her her uh, library, which wasn't very big at all. And it had books, all the Kennedy books all around it. And, uh, and a, a coffee table and a couch. And so, uh, you know, she went in first and she sat down on the couch and then I had to sit on the couch beside her. It wasn't like where we, you know, right. where, where we are right. here with, you know, two chairs. And uh, and so I'm trying to make small talk, you know, with Jackie Kennedy, you know, whatever that whatever I said. I'm glad that wasn't recorded. Yeah. And uh, and then the uh, the guy working there at her house brings in iced tea and little sandwiches and you know again this is you know she had a visitor, a personal visitor. They're gonna this is what we're gonna have. And I'm very conscious of uh, not taking up too much of her time or not imposing in any way, or not taking advantage in any way. Have they given you a slot, like a no. you have from? No, uh, no, it's personal. Yeah. See, it wasn't an appointment. It was more like a visit. If you've ever done an oral history interview, you know that there is an awkward series of moments in the beginning. When you're trying to get set up, you want to make small talk, so you don't appear rude. At the same time, you need to pick the optimal location for the interview. At the same time, get your equipment set up, which if you have a lapel microphone like Bird Whistle was using back then, you would have to hook the lapel mic up and make sure that the levels were good, all the while still appearing to be calm, cool, and collected. But with oral history, the equipment really matters, so you got to get it right. But he'd done this hundreds of times before this, so piece of cake, right? Uh, and then at some point, we, uh, uh, it's obvious we got to get the interview started. And so I, you know, you got to get all your equipment out, you know, and get it set up. Uh, I can't remember if I was using a a charger or a, a you know a power battery pack or a battery or a, whether I plugged it in. I don't remember plugging it in because that meant I'd had to get on the floor. I don't remember getting on the floor and crawling around. Get the two mics and uh, and I, I always told people one of the, the hardest thing you know of the interview was putting that mic on her. And so I, it, you know, I just had to get my hand to stop shaking mm -hmm. to put it on, and we put it on. I mean, you know, I mean, this wasn't anything to her. I mean, she didn't right. see a little tape recorder didn't make any difference to her. And I put mine on, and uh, this is where Murphy's Law kicked in. The most important interview, in some ways, I would ever do, in some ways. But um, so we start the interview. <clears throat> I, I, you know, you, you've listened to the interview. I had some throwaway question, I'm sure, like, so how did you first meet John Sherman Cooper? What's your first memory of John Sherman Cooper? And she starts talking, and 
I was very comfortable at that time with this uh, recorder that we're using because you, you take an earpiece and then you put it up to your ear and you could actually hear what was being recorded. All right, the second tape head. Yeah, so that you were sure that you were getting this. Well, every interview I'd ever done, that worked, except this one. So I put the thing up to my ear, nothing. And so she's talking. And, uh, and obviously I'm having a meltdown right there. Because oh, yeah. she's talking, I'm trying to think what to do, what to do, what to do, what to do. Um, I stop it, I rewind it, push play, listen through the earpiece, nothing. So I stop it, rewind it, take out the earpiece, hit play, and there it is. It was a short in the earpiece. Oh. Now what are the chances? Right. What are the chances? That's and and so I hit record again, and I said, okay, we're good to go. And she goes, is it working? <clears throat> I thought we... Um, Are you sure it's working? Right. I can... It's a good machine because I can monitor actually what's being recorded. Um, I'm, I'm thrown off balance. You know, I'm... I mean, as cool as I am, I was a little shaky at that point, probably. Bird Whistle quickly recovered, regained his rhythm, and the resulting interview is pretty fantastic. Their friendship was so close that the Kennedys spent their first dinner out after the inauguration with the Coopers. One of the great moments of the interview was when Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis recalled this evening, Bird Whistle had done so much homework in doing his research, he even knew the weather outside that evening. I know, to show you what good friends we were, I think I'm right in this. The first dinner party we went to after we were in the White House was at the Coopers. Right, right. And that, uh, that interested a lot of people that uh, the first uh, dinner party would be at the home of, re of a republic. <laughs> well, they were just our beloved friends. I think we'd made the date before. I think it was for some... I think there was some dance or something in Washington that happened, that was happening then, that was sort of an occasion that Lorraine, Mrs. Cooper, had said, that sounded for it. So, you, <laughs> you know, um, then fine. I mean, we didn't go to the dance, whatever it was, but we went there for <laughs> dinner. I think there was a snowstorm that night, wasn't there? Oh, yes, and then I guess the Secret Service ran by with so many loads of sand and everything. You know, it was meant to be rather quiet, but <laughs> all the press was outside. Um, if they were surprised, I remember thinking, well, I'm happy if they're surprised, because if it shows paying homage to Senator Cooper, good. Who's they more worthy of paying homage to? They told many stories about John Sherman Cooper, and even though the focus of the interview was not on Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, she revealed a lot of herself in these interviews because of her friendship and love for the Coopers. And speaking of the Coopers, John Sherman Cooper. This is somebody who clearly is worth learning more about. When Cooper got to the Senate, even when he was in and out, people really liked him. He was a... Uh, he was a serious guy, very smart, and, and would vote his conscience. You know, he was a big supporter of tobacco and all the things about Kentucky, but he was also, you know, right on civil rights and right on a lot of other things. Vietnam, and I think he was... He you know, had the Cooper Church Amendment, trying yeah. to, you know, to bring an end to the Vietnam War. And so um, he was just a very uh, serious, thoughtful guy. And, of course, he'd been ambassador to India, so. yeah, quite a guy. Quite a guy. It's a, and it's a shame that a biography has not been written about him to this point. Many people have tried. Terry Burbusel's 1981 interview with Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis is online at KentuckyOralHistory.org. In its entirety, the John Sherman Cooper Project is not yet online, but as the non center director, I think we need to rethink those priorities. If the Kennedys thought John Sherman Cooper was so important, he probably is. 
The Wisdom Project is a podcast of the Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History in the University of Kentucky Libraries. Check out our collections at kentuckyoralhistory.org and check out our blog at nunncenter.org. Subscribe to the podcast via iTunes. Thanks again for listening. Stay tuned for the next episode.